Would please turn to the book of Luke, chapter 11. I'm teaching a series entitled The Kingdom of God. Cindy, good to see you, by the way. We're so glad that you're here with us. <clears throat> Always good when you can be back from Alaska and be with us here at your home church. So we rejoice in that. Uh, the Kingdom of God is the series. This is the third teaching in the series. It's entitled The Kingdom Comes with Power. I talked about the kingdom lost. I talked about the kingdom comes, and today I want to talk about the kingdom comes with power. And we're going to look at the scripture in verses uh, Luke eleven fourteen 14 down through 20. The actual story goes all the way through down to verse 28, but I'm going to expedite that and just go to verse 20. And that'll be the context we'll deal with today. It says this, And Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. And when the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. So obviously the muteness was the direct result of a demonic entity that was causing him the inability to speak. When he was set free from that demon, then he could communicate, he could speak. Now that doesn't mean everybody that can't speak is demonized, although some may be. In this case, it was so. But some of them said, the onlooker said, by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. If you go to the Old Testament, the book of Kings, there's a story there that's told about Ekron and how Ekron was given to the worship Beelzebul or the prince of, of demons. In other words, it was the Lord of the Flies. And so they're attributing that which he did to the prince of demons, Beelzebul, and putting him in that league and saying, hey, he's like the Lord of the Flies and a part of that. And others tested him by saying for a sign from heaven. He says, do more, do more, they were chanting. Verse 17, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. That could teach for about a week or more. That any kingdom, any state, any country, any community, any family, any household, any church, any husband or wife that is divided they're going to fail. Yep. Right. And so we must be unified. Unity is a very, very important thing. The Bible says in Psalms 133, 1 through 3, how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil that ran down upon Aaron's beard, upon the collars of his robes. And it is there that the Lord commands his blessing. The commanded blessing comes together when brethren dwell together in unity, when husbands and wives dwell together in unity. Yeah. When countries and entities and businesses and churches dwell together in unity. The text goes on to say, what Jesus is really saying, it says, if you're saying I'm casting out demons by the finger of God, then I'm working against myself. It doesn't make any sense. He then goes on to say, I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebul. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? Because there were exorcists in that day. There have been exorcists around for a long time. And they would drive them out with incantations, and they did have some measure of success. So he's saying, if they do it, then who are they doing it by? What's their source of power? But if I drive out, and here's our key, he says, so then you will, they will be your judges, verse 20. But if I drive out, in our key verse, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He was saying, I really do drive out demons by the finger of God, therefore the kingdom has come upon you. It is in the midst of you. It's amazing that in the recent years, I've noticed more and more on television, on news reports, I hear the media talking often about a person that struggles with alcoholism, that struggles with drug addiction, that struggles with promiscuity, or other things that have surfaced in their life, that they often attribute, it says they are battling their demons. How many of you have heard that recently? It's very much in vogue. I don't believe they really realize how true they're really saying it. Because oftentimes there are demonic entities that are really behind that which prompts them to do what they do. Because they've given themselves over to that such a measure that the demonic thing becomes a stronghold in their life that takes control and dictates certain behaviors and patterns in their life. And the only way that they can be free is by getting free through the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. I don't care if you lock them up for 30 days in a rehab center somewhere and give them all kinds of gobbledygook. And, you know, I'm glad for all of that. But the bottom line is if Jesus Christ is not their higher power, they will have an inability to maintain sobriety and freedom and a deliverance. Because it's in the power and the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. 
three things that I want to talk about. First of all, let's just deal with the introduction. My little statement that says, the coming of the kingdom of God is the initial, that means the beginning point, the central, that means the middle point, and the final burden, that means the last, the summation of it all, of the master's proclamation. Jesus' preaching began with the challenge, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is the one and only message that Jesus preached. It is the gospel of the kingdom. That's what he preached. That's what he talked about. That's what he demonstrated. So if that's the case, then it should be the very same thing for us. We can talk about a lot of other things, but when it comes push to shove, at the end of the day, somehow, some way, we ought to be talking about the kingdom of God. Going back to our scripture also, found in the book of Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first. First is always in order of priority. Okay? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God and His righteousness and all other things. Everybody say all other things. All other things. Shall be added unto you. The key to seeing other things in your life is by seeking the kingdom first. It's not a mate. It's not this. It's not that. It's Jesus and His kingdom first. When you will seek that first, everything else will come in its proper priority and its proper order. All my life I've endeavored to seek the kingdom first. The decisions that I've made since I was a little boy have been predicated on the fact that I'm the Lord's, I belong to Him first and foremost, and therefore what I do and how I do it is because of the direct relationship of His influence in my life. In my life. And that's the way I've lived my life. Now, three things that we want to talk about in our teaching this morning, the kingdom comes with power as we're dealing with this subject of the kingdom of God. The first is this. It's found in part A of verse 20. But if I drive out demons, everybody say demons. demons. Now, demons are real beings. They're disembodied spirits, disembodied entities. Most theologians, I agree with them, are fa- agree that they are fallen angels who join with Satan in rebellion against God. The Bible does not explicitly discuss their origin, but the New Testament does speak of the fall and then later an imprisonment of a group of angels, not all of them, but a segment of them. They must have been really bad to have gotten locked up as seen in 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude 6. They are held in chains right now at this point in time. The totality of the fallen angels are the demonic beings. Their rebellion apparently occurred before God's creation of the world. And afterwards, Satan and his followers, that's the demons, Roam the new creation, this planet we call Earth, eventually contaminating the human race with wickedness as seen in Genesis 3, Matthew 25, 41, and Revelation 12, verse number 9. To this day, they continue to oppose God's purposes and undermine the cause of righteousness. Did you hear what I said? Undermine the cause of righteousness. That means they seek to destroy righteousness. Now, what I said a moment ago, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Well, they want to do everything to uh, pull out and to move the underpinnings of righteousness in an individual's life. Demons are real. They're not a figment of somebody's imaginations. Demons just aren't down in the Bahamas. They're not just down in Trinidad. They're not just over in Africa. They're not just over in India. They're everywhere. I've been a lot of places, and I've seen demonic things there. And I'll tell you what, I've been in America, and there are demons here just as well as there are there. So what we're talking about then is demonic beings. They're they're an entity. You see, one of Jesus' primary purposes was to overcome the power of Satan, which is why he regularly challenged the demonic realm. Write down 1 John 3, 8. It says this, For this reason was the Son of God made manifest. In other words, why did He come to planet Earth? He had a purpose. Now, His purpose becomes our purpose. This means yes. Yes. So if you're agreeing with me today and would say that God's purpose, Jesus' purpose is our purpose, yes. yes. For this reason was the Son of God made manifest, that He might destroy the works of the enemy. What are the enemy's works? Hunger, pain, sickness, disease, poverty, destruction, injustice. All of those things are the obvious end result of the work of the enemy. Jesus came to destroy it. It was his purpose. It's our purpose. If we are kingdom people, and we are, look at your neighbor and say, you are. Look at your other neighbor and say, you are also. 
And as a result of that, as kingdom people, our purpose is his purpose to destroy the works of the enemy. Now, you can't do that in and of yourself. That's why the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, uh, verse 10, it says, be not strong. It says, be not, it says, no, that's, that's not right. It says this, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Not your might, his might. Then it goes on to say, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, wickedness, rulers in high places. Four levels or entities are hierarchies of the demonic realm. So they have a structure. They operate within a certain way. They do certain things. And as a result of that, they're very orderly. Yes. They follow a chain of command. They understand authority. That's why when Jesus was talking and there was a guy who came to him and he says, I've not found such great faith in all of Israel. He says, this man who is a centurion captain, he comes and he says to me, he says, I don't even need to see Jesus. Just give the word because I tell my servants, go and he goes. I tell this one, come and he comes. He says, I've not found such great faith in all of Israel because this guy understood the chain of command and authority. I would to God that the body of Christ in the same way would understand authority and the chain of command working within the confines of leadership and anointing and the power structure which God has given us. That we might defeat the wiles of the enemy that is affecting not only our lives but our families' lives and the church body that we're a part of and extended into kingdoms and nations. Because remember what we said when we started this whole message. It is the heart and the will of God. This is the words of Jesus. They're not John's words. They're not made up by somebody else. But Jesus himself says, your kingdom come, your will be done. We're at on earth as it is in heaven. The dominion of God come and make a difference in the here and now. So we want to see these demons drawn and released and, and, and their power rendered null and void. Go with me to the book of Mark's Gospel. Don't lose your place here. We'll come back. But go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. Now, if you'll notice something, at the very beginning, at the very onset of Jesus' ministry, his ministry was demonstrated by that of casting out of demons. Mark, chapter 1. In fact, if you find the same passage in the book of Luke, parallel passage, we won't go there. We're going to deal with the Mark passage. But right after Jesus came out of the wilderness, preached his first message in the hometown synagogue, then he, he was at Capernaum, and he's in Capernaum. He's in church. He's in church on a Saturday. It would be like us being in church on a Sunday. Everybody at Mark chapter 1, verse 21. They went to Capernaum, and as the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. Some of your versions will say, as his custom was. I like that. It was normal for him to be in the house of the Lord on the Lord's day. And the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. Exosia, anointing. Not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue, everybody say, in the church. It says then, a man in the church, in their synagogue, who was possessed by an impure spirit, cried out. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. In the average church of America, it would scare the wits out of most people sitting in a church if a de demonized person cried out the top of the lungs and says, Hey, what are you having to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Everybody would go like this. Whoop. Wherever it was coming from, their heads would automatically turn, and they would all freak out and say, What is going on in this place? This place is weird. Mabel, we need to get out of here. Not realizing it was the normative experience in the life of Jesus Christ that everywhere he went, he had power encounters with demonic entities. He didn't go, he didn't go looking for demons. Guess what? They just were there, and when they, they were there, and they manifested when he showed up. I would to God that the power and the anointing on you is so strong that wherever you go, that when you begin to move into different places and circles and places of influence that God has given you, that power encounters take place, that the spirit that's in somebody else is encountering the spirit of God that's inside of you that is greater. Come on, somebody. First John 4, 4. Year of God, little children, and have overcome them for greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. That when that spirit speaks out of them because of a divine clash, a power encounter, that you deal with that thing just like Jesus did. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Do you see he didn't pamper it? Oh, 
let me just come over and be so compassionate to this person and rub their shoulder a little bit and say, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay, honey. It's going to be all right. No, it says he spoke sternly to the spirit because he recognized it was the entity that was talking through the person. It wasn't the person themselves. So he dealt very firmly, but lovingly with the person, but firmly with the demon that was manifesting. What is this? A new teaching and with authority. Oh, well, it says the impure shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. Yee. Now, how many of you had freaked the place out? <laughs> yeah. And the people were all amazed so that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching. And with authority, he even gives orders to the impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly all over the whole region of Galilee. Now, I don't know. It just says it was an impure spirit. An impure spirit has all kinds of things associated or attached to it that causes that person to operate within the realm of impurity, whether it be sexual impurity or other kinds of impurity. That was what the spirit was known for. So therefore, it would have manifested that in that individual. All I know is that dude went away free that day to the glory of God. Amen. He didn't go out and have a 12-step program, although I'm not against that. He didn't go to the rehab center for 30 days, although I'm not against that. I'm just putting it into perspective. Wouldn't it be great if people could get delivered that were in bondage to certain things? That's demons. They're real. They're not fake, and they do harass and deal with people in all kinds of manners. Number two, go back to the book of Luke, chapter 11, again, verse 20. But if I drive out demons, note this, by the finger of God... By the finger of God. That's significant because it has import and meaning. Now, it would have to the Jews as well. They would have understood it. And so Jesus uses it to help share imagery to note that if I cast out demons by the finger of God. Do you remember in the book of uh, Daniel chapter 5? In Daniel chapter 5, there's been some changes of leadership. You had Nebuchadnezzar. Then you had Belshazzar, which would be a son, a progeny of his. It wasn't necessarily his biological son, but one who came to rulership in Babylon. And Belshazzar was throwing a great big party, and they had taken all the goblets from the temple in Jerusalem, and they had brought them to Babylon. And they were having this gigantic party, and they were partying down. They were getting drunk and carrying on. And while they were getting drunk and carrying on, Belshazzar was saying, oh, look at how awesome I am. In essence, is what he was saying to all his gathered guests. And about that, ha- about that time, a human hand wrote on a thing above their heads. Many, many tinkle and parsum. You have been weighed. You have been found weighed and wanting and, hang- and your life is hanging in the balance. And your life will be quiet of you this very night. At that point in time, the Persians invaded. And as they came in, that army took him over and he was dead that night. But it was that human hand of God that manifested in that capacity. Another way, and let's go there to the book of Exodus, which they would have understand firmly. In Exodus chapter 8, if you would please, I want to show you that even the magicians during the time when Pharaoh was there and he was persecuting the nation of Israel, they were wanting to go worship the Lord. And they were going through the different plagues. And this happened to be the plague of gnats. I hate gnats. Hate them when they land on you. You know, they're smaller than a mosquito. And they just buzz around and they're just worth nothing, if you ask me. But it was one of the plagues. They had gone through the snake being you know, made from the staff, made into a snake, and the Egyptian musicians could do that. And then they threw Moses' staff down, and it became a big snake, and it bit that one and overtook it. The plague of blood, plague of frogs. And now look at verse 16. Exodus 8, 16. And then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. And that throughout the land, the Egypt, the dust will become gnats. That would be a sad thing if that happened. He says, and he struck, and he says, yeah, they did this. And when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, the gnats be- came on people and animals. And all the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. But the, when the magicians tried to produce the gnats by their secret arts, they could not. Since the gnats were on the people and animals everywhere, note this, verse 19, the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen just As the Lord said, they attributed that which had happened to the power of God. In essence, what Jesus is saying, that deliverance of demons is a work of the power of God wrought by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
See, this phrase recalls this passage. And as a result of it, they were forced to confess that Moses' miracles were the real handiwork of God. They weren't fakery. They weren't chicanery. They weren't trickery, but they were of God Almighty. They were work of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we conclude that the finger of God is the same as the Holy Spirit of God because we find out in Matthew 12, 28, that's what it says. If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, it's the parallel passage. We see that Jesus is also in this same business of setting people free. Demons can afflict people with physical symptoms such as muteness, which we just talked about a moment ago, causing somebody the inability to speak. They can cause deafness. They can cause blindness. They can cause bodily deformity. In the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 10 through 17, remember the story? There was a woman who for 18 years was bent over. Human deformity of being bent over. Now, you probably have all seen people with different deformities on their physical bodies. And in some of those cases, they were demonically inspired. Some, I understand, are genetic malformations that take place. I understand all of that. And I also understand that God is supersedes genetics. God can supernaturally move beyond that. I long for the day. I got to tell you, one of the one of the commercials that tears me up every time I see it is is the the Shriners commercial on Fox that all these kids come out with arms that are missing, legs that are missing, and my heart. I literally I got to almost turn a channel. I can't take that. You know, I'm mean in a lot of other areas. I'll just admit to that. I'm ask my wife. <laughs> I can be really cantankerous and mean about certain things, but that'll melt my heart in a heartbeat. I see that, and the compassion of Jesus just goes, and I just, I'll tear up. And I'm glad nobody's around to watch it when it happens. Because I say, Lord, one day these kids will not have these malformations. You will heal them. You'll restore them. You will make them whole. In fact, there are certain countries even now, and I pray to God that we would see it in our time, in our locale, where literally literally arms are growing out. Legs are growing out. So I say, Lord, if you can do it there, do it here. The story is told of John G. Lake. And there was a young man that had a head that was basic like an inverted canoe. And that his head was growing and his brain was growing, but the skull was growing like a canoe, a great big crown in it. So this thing was like huge with the big crown in the middle like this. So like if you flipped it over, it'd be like canoe shaped or boat shaped. And this thing was like this and it was just growing and expanding in his, his skull. It was just like, it was, just, you know, hideous. I mean, to see that you'd like, oh, you know, you don't want to stare, but it's like you look and you're just like, wow, what is that? It's like a human natural reaction. And John G. Lake one day prayed for this young boy as he laid his hands upon him. All of a sudden, like bones began to crack, (coughs) noise. This kid began to scream. And when he did, all of a sudden, that concave skull went and it returned to its normal size. No longer was it concave like a canoe or like a boat, but it was round and shaped the way that it was needed to be. Lord, in Jesus' name, do it again in our day. Whether that was demonically inspired, I don't know. Genetically inspired, I don't know. I just say the power and the work of Jesus Christ and the finger of God and the anointing of God do it in our day. Amen. Heal and restore. While I'm on it, I might as well tell you about another story. John G. Lake, and you all know he ministered in five years in Spokane, ministered five years in Africa. God used him phenomenally in signs, wonders, and miracles. And there was a lady that was, had come to his meetings And he had prayed for her, and she had had a hysterectomy because she had problems with her uterus and therefore had a total hysterectomy. Now, you know, when you have a total hysterectomy, you cannot have kids. And she was a younger woman and so therefore was not able to conceive and bear children. He laid hands. This was medically proven, by the way. It was not something that somebody made up, said, I heard that I heard. No, it was documented. He laid hands on her and prayed for her womb. Her womb was restored. Her uterus regained. She was married, conceived, had, had a baby through a pregnancy and gave a baby, but, but when she had had no womb, it was medically proven. And that is a, that's a miracle. That's a work of power. That's what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ can do. Can somebody say amen to that? 
So demons affect people in different ways. The gospels actually distinguish between sickness and demon possession. Demons can also cause mental and emotional problems. So some of the stuff that you see that you attribute to psychiatric needing care, they need deliverance. They don't need psychiatric care. And then some that says, well, they're psychiatric, they, 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 need, de- they need deliverance from demons. And then some that maybe think they're demon-possessed actually need psychiatric care and maybe some medicine. Hello. It's not an either-or, it's an end-or. It could be both things. I remember... I remember talking with Bob Larson, and Bob was talking one time, and he goes, you know, he says, the amazing thing, but most of the people that come to me in my meetings that uh, think they don't need deliverance usually do, and those that usually think they need deliverance don't. <laughs> he, said, he said that, honestly. He says, a lot of times it's those that don't think they do that do, and those that think they do don't. And he says, and there are some that just to eat, need to eat some protein because they're having a problem physiologically. Your diet can affect your behavior. I don't know if you realize that or not. So there's a myriad of things that, that, that are together here. And that's why the medical community gets to, needs to get with the church and, and that we would come together and dovetail in the healing purposes of God mixed together to bring totality of healing to the total person, spirit, soul, and body. Because some people that are whacked out mentally, there can be some imbalances chemically that could be balanced by medicine or God's supernatural touch that will bring them to wholeness. Let that sink in for a little bit. But it's amazing what demons do cause and the problems they can cause people and individuals. The demon-possessed person might rant and rave. They have uncontrolled fits. And by the way, I have scripture for every one of these, but if I gave them to you, it'd take forever for me to say all of this. They behave in antisocial behavior. Oftentimes, they are withdrawn, don't want to be around people. Remember the one in the tombs, Mark chapter 5? And by the way, don't lump everybody into that category because sometimes your personality and your temperament, you don't need a lot of people. Okay? You'd rather not be without people because they drain you. Sometimes that's just your temperament. It has nothing to do with being a, having a demon, being demonized. Okay? I'm very social. You know that? I'm very gregarious, outgoing, I love people. But I also like times by myself yeah. where I don't need people around, and I'm okay with that. Because yeah. when I get somewhere, I'll meet somebody and I'll talk to them anyway. <laughs> so I honestly don't need a lot of people around. So it's nice for me to recharge my batteries in that way. Friday was one such day, all by myself. Started off calling. Um, I, was, I called the crooks because she was going into the hospital and just had a quick window, so I didn't get to see them till yesterday. Then I got in my truck and fueled up, and I was driving to the coast. The only river that I know would have steelhead and, and be fishable was clear down on the south coast, and I can't tell you where that is because it needs to remain private. <laughs> <laughs> I did, actually. I saw elk and saw turkeys and had an awesome day and loved God's out and, and of course, talked to people. Because when it's like that, and the locals all know where this river is, it's the only one fishable. They're all there. And you're vying for a place. And you just jump in with the rest of them. When I got there, I helped a guy tail a fish right off the bat. He had just just caught when I showed up at the river. Then I helped another guy tail a fish that he had just hooked right when I was there. I said, this is going to be an awesome day. Saw other fish caught. I caught one, should have had more, but I didn't. Saw elk and all kinds of cool stuff. Came home, and it started raining like crazy. This is my day on Friday. I got to where I got to Florence, and I was coming up. You know, when you come from Florence towards Mapleton, and there's the tunnel, and everybody know where the tunnel is. Is it Long Hill, and then it turns. When I got there, traffic is totally stopped. There's a car, a car, and then me. On the other side, there's more cars that had just come through the tunnel and were making the turn. In front of that car was a car totally demolished. There was a trailer with a truck over here. There was a car that had been in a wreck with some kids and family members. They looked fine. There was a pickup that was over this way, and I think he was the one that caused the major damage, though I don't know who at fault it was. But as I looked at somebody's uh, Caribbean music's going off, you might want to catch that. (laughs) 
And I, and I stopped and we're blinking traffic and it's a mess. And so I get out and I walk up and immediately I see Coralie Slager, somebody I know for years, and her husband Terry sitting in the rig and she's out and somebody else and a guy and they're over by the cards demolished. And they go, there's a driver in the passenger seat, but he's non-responsive. I went up and looked in the window. I'm pretty sure the guy was gone. When you face those moments, you think immediately, look at the joy I had today, but then this man's life more than likely snuffed out. I don't know for sure, but just the way things looked, it looked like it. After I was able to talk to her a little bit and we chatted and other stuff, we were able to get away and get through and go around. No ambulance there, no cops there yet. I mean, this is how fresh in the car started lining up and everything. This is my day on Friday. And I'm thinking, Lord, wow, what a day I had with you and now I'm here. Remember what I said, I don't need to have people, but it's nice to have people. And so as I go, I reflect upon that. I says, in a moment of time, somebody's life could be gone. And it brings you back to the reality. And I sat there in sober silence because I think, here's what I think all the time. Did that person know you? Did they have a relationship with you? I'm a bringer of the kingdom, and I think about that everywhere. And then I think about the people in my life. Lord, should I be more bold in my... Uh, this, this is what goes through my mind. I'm just trying to be honest with you. What goes through my mind? Do I need to be more bold with those around me? That I've modeled your presence. Do I need to be more strategic in sharing my faith with them? about Jesus Christ. And there's that fine point that you know you're led of the Spirit of God. But that's what I think because I, I never want anybody to go into eternity without knowing Jesus or having heard about Him. That's right. I said all that because I talked about people. Some don't need people, some do. It's just a matter of personality. But that was my day on Friday. Got home. Kids were over and grandkids were over and Helen's there, we're all there, and we come in, and I blew it. I, I, I had said something. I thought I was going to get Helen. She thought I was going to get her supper, and I didn't. We had some strong words of discussion, and we worked that all out. <laughs> but we all share days like that. And like I said, some people have a greater need for people than others. It's not an either or. But some cases, the antisocial behavior is demonically inspired. There are people that have uncontrolled fits. Man at Gadarene, chapter 5. In casting out demons, Jesus and his disciples used methods that differed radically from the mystical rites so often employed at that time, which they would do incantations. In fact, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can find that the Dead Sea Scrolls, that, the, uh, that when they discovered them, there were actual incantations that exorcists used to cast demons out of people. And I'm not talking about Jesus, the believers, and the followers of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about Jewish exorcists. And if you remember the story, there were some exorcists that were in Acts 19. And when Paul was doing extraordinary miracles, even handkerchiefs that touched people, it says demons went out of them and their sicknesses went from them. It says there were seven sons of Sceva. And it says they went and they tried to cast the demons out of one guy. And here's what the demon spoke out of the man. Remember, the demon will speak and use a person's voice to communicate through them. And it says, Paul I know, Jesus I know, but who are you? And it says that that man that was demonized jumped on seven guys, beat the tarnation out of them till they ran away naked and bleeding. I think that's awesome. I think that's awesome. You say, well, what's the big deal with that? It's this. Is your name known in heaven and in hell? See, because demons know those who have authority over them. It's not how loud you shout. It's the authority that you wield, whether you shout or whether you whisper. The demons know whether you got the authority or not. And that's what Jesus and his disciples did. They exercised the authority, and then the disciples used the authority that was given them. They added the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, we bind you. In Jesus' name, we command you to come out. It's using the name of Jesus, the authority to command. As seen in Luke 10, 17, Acts 16, 18. 
It's demonstrating the kingdom. So we see, first and foremost, demons are real. Secondly, we see that people need to be delivered. It's by the Spirit of God. It's not by your ability. It's not by your name. It's the name of Jesus. And then number three is dominion. Take a look, if you would, at Luke chapter 11, verse 20. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then point number three, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. If somebody to ask you this question, what is the kingdom of God? Your simple, most basic answer should be this to them. The kingdom of God is the rule of God. That's it. It's the rule of God. It's God's rule, first and foremost, in your heart and in your life. Secondly, it's God's rule in your household, in your family. I love the story of Joshua when he gets to the end of his life and they're getting ready to cross over. No, they've already crossed over. What's the matter with me? No, that's not right. Joshua. I'm thinking of Joshua. Joshua, Moses, Joshua. Remember this? And it says that it gets to the end of his life and he, and he says that the, the, the people are now. Now, how do you know it's next generation is always important because the next generation, if they don't catch that spirit of God that's on you, they're going to miss it and they're going to have to go around the around the mountain until they find it. The same heart of God and the move of God and the works of God and the demonstration of the power of God. If they don't catch it, that's why my heart is now, I am 61 years of age. Yes, I said it publicly, nationally, in every way, shape, and form. That's really how old I am. Now, I, don't, I know I don't look that old. My simple point is this, in the time that I've lived, I've come to a place in my life that I realize this message of the kingdom as God is so crucial to the body of Christ to grasp to hold of because it's the message that Jesus preached. It's the message the disciples preached. It's the message that the apostles in the early church preached, that it's all about the kingdom, the rule of God, the domain of God, the king's domain. That's right. And that we are here and we are seeing the king's domain come. And that for me now, as I am getting ready to transition in the next however many years, I am transitioning. And by the way, I'll be doing this till I'm 80 some, just so you know. I'm not, I'm not planning on checking out anytime soon, but I do believe in raising up. I do believe in raising up and mentoring people that are taking over a lot of responsibility. Are you hearing me? So in that process of transitioning and passing the mantle to the next generation, I don't want them to have to go through what I had to go through to fight and to grasp for what I've learned and understood and have received by faith and by training and teaching that they are accelerated, that they, they get it faster than I got it that it's able to impart it to the next generation or that the baton is not dropped and that you have to go through a whole other generation because they miss out. That's right. I'm very concerned about that. Amen. As should be anybody in my name as we're transi- at my age, my name, my age as we're transitioning. That's right. Amen. That we would see it's the king's domain. And that his miracles represented the arrival of God's power and promise. In short, his rule. That rule comes in and through Jesus Christ, as we see in Matthew 6.10, which I already quoted. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The miracles of Jesus demonstrate God's victory over the forces of evil. The kingdom program has depicted as drawing near will be consummated at the return of Jesus when this rule is manifested over every creature and all of creation. See, dominion is the miracles that he performs are the evidence of those who have eyes to see that God is at work. And to borrow the phrase made popular by the George Eldon Ladd, the kingdom of God is already and not yet. God's kingdom has a dual dimension. Okay, dual dimension. Jesus initiated the kingdom on earth, and wherever the king, God's will is carried out, the kingdom is reality. Get that. Wherever God's will is carried out, That's where kingdom reality is at. That's why his will is people healed, people saved, people restored, people baptized in the Holy Spirit, people water baptized, people delivered, people enjoying God's blessing and prosperity. Are you hearing me? That is the will of God. And where God's will is manifested throughout the earth, there is the kingdom. It has come with power and it's making a difference in that arena. So we contend for that. We battle that. We put the enemy on notice. We are in a battle. Has the battle already been won? 
Yes, yeah. where? At Calvary's cross through Christ's yeah. death, burial, and resurrection. It's been put in effect. But now we're enforcing the victory of Calvary. We're enforcing the victory of Calvary. We're enforcing it. It's kind of like this. If you have a property, and we find this when we go hunting, when we go hunting in the fall, and there's a private property that butts up to BLM land or government land or whatever, sometimes because that land is a private ranch, and it's maybe a ranch that people hunt on, there are people that patrol it so that nobody crosses over. Over to take game off of that property that is not rightfully that person's that's crossed and, and they've, they've gone onto that property. So they're patrolling it. In the same way, the enemy has not realized he has encroached upon the land of the king and the kingdom. We're patrolling in the property and we are kicking the giants off the land. Amen. And that's why when people say, well, when I, when I get to heaven, uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be dealing with the giants. There ain't no giants in the promised land, that's folks. Right. The giants are here. We're dealing with the giants now. Amen. And so that's why I like the story of David and Goliath. That David understood his authority. He understood the king's domain, the king's dominion. Here's a kid, probably 15 years old, 16 years old at the most. You have this guy who is the champion. By the way, he is the collegiate, which means the champion of the nation of the Philistines. And he parades out there. He's nine feet tall. His, his spearhead weighs so many pounds. His armor of coat of mail weighs so many pounds. And every day he comes out and he taunts the Israelites. And he says, if you'll send your champion in, I'll take him out. And whoever wins that will then, you'll send subservient be subservient to this kingdom and so this is going on day after day David has been assigned by his daddy to take cheese meat and some other stuff to his brothers and go on out and meet his brothers in the field he goes and he hears this he's just a boy he goes and he hears this and this guy's taunting and as he's taunting David something rises up in David that ought to rise up in you as a child of God that is a child of the king that is a king's kid that is a person living the kingdom on purpose and it says as he hears that he hears this guy taunting the armies of Israel here's David's response who is this uncircumcised Philistine that taunts the living God and he's mad because nobody's doing anything about it they're all cowering in fear because they don't understand their authority. They don't understand the mantle that is on them. They don't understand the dominion that they carry because they're king's kids. And David says, I'm going to go take care of this guy. And so what ends up happening, they bring him to Saul, and Saul says, hey, who are you? By the way, well, I'm the son of Jesse, and da 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 and they have this whole thing going on, dialogue going on. And he says, all right, well, I'll let you go, but you got to put on my armor. So he puts Saul's armor on. It's too big. Can't do it. By the way, if you ever read the story about Saul, Saul's head and shoulders above everybody. Yes. It ain't David. By the way, there's a whole lesson in that. Be who God created you to be. You can't wear somebody else's armor. You can't be somebody else. you got to be you. I mean, I've tried it. I've tried to preach like certain people in my time space, and you know what? I realize I can't do that. i just got to be who I am. Amen. Who I am. Be the preacher God created me to preach like. You know, because I went to the latest seminar and came back and tried to act like they ain't going to cut it. <laughs> My wife says, praise the Lord for that. Amen. So I'm loud. I mean, it's just, I, I start off quiet and slow, but at some point I transition because it's how God's wired me. And I'm glad you like it because you're here. So he goes out there, and he gets rid of Saul's armor because it ain't doing jack for him, man. He goes to the stream because he knows how to throw a sling. And he sits down, and he kneels down, and he grabs five smooth stones. you ever wonder why the five smooth stones? Because there was Goliath and his four brothers. By the way, I don't know if you realize that they're all giants too. Because you find it in other texts of the Bible. So he grabs five stones, puts them in his pouch, goes on over, and their sling is like this. It's like two straps long and a thing in the middle. He puts the rock in there, and he comes out, and what he does is he starts twirling that sling like this. And when he lets go at the proper time of that one strand, that rock shoots out, and it hits that uncircumcised Philistine right smack in the middle of the forehead. That big old nine-foot guy went down like a rock. Kaboom. David ran over. He grabbed this massive sword out of the, out of, out of the scabbard, out of, out of Goliath's scabbard, and he turns around and he cuts his head off. And he grabs his head and puts it up, and the old army goes, Yeah! And I can just see him in slow motion running. 
All of a sudden, they got some guts now. You got a 15, 16-year-old kid who kills the giant and cuts his head off. And I'm telling you, they're rallying to the charge now. Now they're all behind him. (laughs) When all along, they had the same ability. When all along, they belonged to the same king. Dominion, it's the king's rule. It's coming. You see, Jesus initiated the kingdom on earth, and whenever God's will is carried out, the kingdom is a reality. We feel the tension of experiencing God's kingdom in our life and communities before it is fully realized. We still see unbelief, brokenness, and sin, telling us God's will is not yet fully experienced. But it will be one day. And until then, we continue to be bringers of the kingdom, that the kingdom would come with power. I close with this statement. John the Baptist astonished his hearers when he announced that this expected and hoped for kingdom was at hand in the person of Jesus, as seen in Matthew 3, 2. Jesus repeated this message in Matthew 4, 17 and Mark 1, 15, which is our foundational text. But he went even further by announcing clearly that the kingdom was already present in his ministry. As we've already quoted out of Matthew 12, 28, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus was the full embodiment of the kingdom. And you know what? We are his body. Amen. Now Amen. on planet earth. Amen. I want to encourage you today. The kingdom has come with power. Amen. Therefore, we are not powerless. We are powerful. Amen. So when you meet that power encounter, it's not like you're trying to try to pick a fight. But what we're simply doing is going out and we are reclaiming the territory that belongs to Jesus Christ. So we have challenged our people here. And what we're doing now over the next few months and into this coming year in 2018 is we're taking our church building as an epicenter. Did you notice I said church building because it's not the church. We are the ones that are the church. We just have a building that we get to come and gather in. And we're going to take a map and we're going to draw in the middle like a compass with the middle being our building in one mile north, one mile south, one mile east, and one mile west, and begin to go out. And right now, Joseph and Joe are going out once a week. This is their second time out. And they're going out, and they're doing a prayer walk. And what they're doing is they're enforcing the victory of Calvary. When they sense pushback, they just say, we take this land That's and territory right. in the name and the authority of That's Jesus right. Christ. Amen. They may sense pressure. They may sense all kinds of things. Amen. But how do you know the greater one lives on the inside of us? Amen. They're not going to try to pick a fight. They're simply going to enforce the victory of Calvary and declare that which belongs to the Lord as reclaimed. It's his. And that means the people that are in this territory. Then Amen. we're going to widen it out to two miles and then three miles and then four miles, and then five miles. And already some of you come from further places. Venita, Junction City, Cresswell, Cottage Grove, and beyond, Alaska. (laughs) And we're glad that you're here. You're here strategically planted of the Lord to be a kingdom outpost that where you are, that you're influencing those locales for the cause of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, it really doesn't matter what it looks like on the world scene. And every time something starts going right, people get all nervous and they say, oh, Jesus must be coming. You know what? I've heard that forever. Get over yourself. <laughs> Knock that off. He's been coming for the last 2,000 plus years. And just because things get unsettled doesn't mean beans. Other than his coming is nearer now than when you first believed. Your job is not an escape mentality. Oh, God, get me out of here. I don't know if I can make it until Jesus comes. Help, Cecil, help. Help, Cecil, help. Remember the Beanie and Cecil show when they're again? If you're wondering, what in the world is this guy talking about? As I got to go back to my statement that I started at the beginning of this series, Jesus wants his kingdom to come to earth. That's That's okay to visit heaven once in a while. And we'll be there one day. Are you all with me? But he really wants the presence of heaven and the purposes of heaven to be made manifest on earth. And in the right time, he will come in his second coming. And we'll leave that up to him. In the meantime, 
Don't get so caught up about, we got to get out of here. We're going out of here. Yay. You know, the Jewish calendar says on this date and this date and the rabbis and there's the red cow and the red heifer in Israel and now the temple can be rebuilt. Who cares? (laughs) Now, I got to admit, I used to be all caught up in all of that. Uh And it's good to know that. I'm not opposed to that. I'm just saying simply, your main purpose, say to me, my main purpose purpose. is to advance the kingdom of God. Be aware of that. Now, don't say this, but you can be aware of that. But your main purpose is to advance the kingdom of God. 